talk a little bit about, at least at the beginning, the origins of uh, intellectual property law. Uh, because um, uh, by way of background, it's important for you to know where this law comes from. What are we talking about here? And when it comes to patent and trademark and copyright law, as I said on, in one of the first lectures, it all goes back really to the United States Constitution. So there's, under Article One, Section 8, um, there's a clause in the United States Constitution which gives Congress the power to write these laws. Um, the laws that we follow in intellectual property all come from uh, either Congress or the courts. And where Congress gets the power to uh, write these laws is from Article One, Section 8, which states pretty plainly, the Congress shall have power to provide for the general welf welfare of the United States and the important clause is to promote the progress of science and useful arts. That's patents. By securing for limited times to authors and inventors, obviously that's copyrights and, and patents, the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. That's where it all, that's the original source material. That's where the, the law that uh, we all have to follow when... Uh, filing intellectual property protection applications and so forth, that's where it all comes from. Um, the clause, which is known as the Patent and Copyright Clause of the United States Constitution, is the foundation of everything that uh, we have to follow. All of the laws, all of the statutes, all of the Supreme Court decisions, all of the decisions by the United States District Courts, all of the decisions by the, by the um, appellate courts, all uh, uh, flow from Article I, Section 8. Um, it was suggested by James Madison and Charles Cotsworth uh, Pinckney in the Federalist Papers. I don't know if you know this, but Madison and Franklin and Jefferson and all of the founders were not only um, gifted political uh, philosophers, but they were also very, very accomplished inventors and writers. Um, and they all knew, uh, since uh, they came from uh, the British system, uh, of the importance of uh, intellectual property uh, laws. And when they sat down and write the con wrote the Constitution, it was not only on the basis of their knowledge as political philosophers uh, about the importance of uh, intellectual property protection, but it had a practical significance and meaning to them because they were all some of the most prolific patent uh, uh, inventors and uh, writers, uh, uh, people who enjoy copyright protection for their inventions uh, and books back in England. And so basically what they did is they took the origins of intellectual property law in England and brought them to this country. Intellectual property law goes back a long way. It goes back to actually the earliest intellectual property law goes back to the Greeks and the Venetians. The Venetians were great uh, makers of glass uh, and, and metals, talking about material science. And so some of the very earliest patents uh, all were um, uh, uh, invented, if you will, or created or thought up uh, by the Venetians. Um, so. Um, after you have the United States Constitution, you have the laws passed by Congress. Title 35 of the United States Code governs all aspects of patent law in the United States. So when you hear someone refer to Title 35 or Section 35 United States Code, that's talking about all of the laws that uh, pertain to patents. And it starts with Title 35 uh, and starts with Section 1, it goes through uh, hundreds of sections, but all of it pertains to patent law. Um, copyright law is governed by Title 17 and um, uh, trademark law, uh, Title 15. Um, after these statutes, you have federal and state common law. So if you, if, if, if you want to look at it this way, the Congress sort of paints the broad outline of patent and trademark and copyright law. And then the courts come in and sort of fill in the details. Um, the courts uh, have the constitutional authority to interpret 
um, the, um, uh, the statutes passed by Congress. Uh, and so, obviously, uh, you know the famous word, uh, the famous answer for, for all questions uh, legal is, it depends. So, um, while Congress provides the very broad outline and the requirements for patents, trademarks, and copyrights, the real details are left to the courts to fill in. So you have the Constitution, then you have the uh, various statutes passed by Congress, Title 35, Title 17, Title 15, and then underneath that you have the, the common law, uh, starting with the United States Supreme Court, and then you have the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, you have then the Federal District Courts, but you also have state common law rights. Um, it may interest you to know that the first uh, patent granted uh, in the United States was uh, granted in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and, and so we, we here in Massachusetts have some of the oldest um, uh, and most influential uh, intellectual property law uh, there is. In fact, Madison and Jefferson uh, and Pinckney all based the uh, clause, Article, Article 1, uh, uh, Section 8 on the Massachusetts, uh, existing Massachusetts intellectual property law. So Massachusetts really not only was the first to um, patent a, an invention, but in many ways Massachusetts provided the, the blueprint for the federal system. And so uh, the, the state courts of, of, uh, of Massachusetts and the rest of the country also provide detail and fill in the blanks when it comes to um, what constitutes intellectual property uh, here in this country. Um, trademark law is uh, a different clause in the Constitution. Originally, Congress tried to pass a trademark law uh, using um, uh, Article I, Section 8, the, um, the, um, uh, the clause that patents and uh, copyrights are based on, but the United States Supreme Court struck it down and so uh, later Congress came along and uh, passed what's called the Lanham Act, which is Title 15, and it's based on the Commerce Clause of the United States, um, which uh, the United States Supreme Court ultimately found was a constitutional exercise of um, Congress's authority. All right, so with that sort of background as uh, an overview for um, intellectual property law, I want to talk specifically about patents because patents really resonate for material science students. Um, and um, I thought uh, before we learned how to file a patent application later on Friday, it would be a good idea to tell you what needs to go in to a patent application. So um, I want to discuss the requirements of uh, patent protection. There are basically four requirements uh, in order to qualify for patent protection. Um, first of all, uh, the invention, the thing you want to patent, must be statutory. And what do I mean by statutory? It must be uh, included as uh, an invention, as an invention is defined under Title 35. So Title 35, the United States Code, is the statute enabled, uh, enacted by Congress which enables uh, patents to be uh, issued. And so the first requirement is it must comply with that statute. The second thing um, you, you have to have in order for an invention to be patentable is it has to be new. Um, or uh, uh, in the law we call that the novelty requirement. The third thing it has to be is it has to be useful. Okay? If you, re if you recall from the clause I quoted from the United States Constitution, the word useful is actually included in the Constitution. In other words, it has to do something, okay? And the last thing uh, is it must be non-obvious. And I'll go into each one of these requirements. But every time you file a patent application, the claims examiner that you get at the United States Patent and Trademark Office is going to be looking to see if your invention satisfies these four requirements. This is it. Nothing more but nothing less. Okay, so the statutory requirement. So the statutory requirement is the easiest of all the requirements to fulfill because here in the United States, our Title V um, really uh, is 
as broad a definition of an invention as exists in the whole world. Um, the statute uh, provides that processes, machines, articles of manufacture, and compositions of matter are patentable. In fact, can anybody think of anything that is not covered under that very broad definition of what is patentable in the United States? Uh, I can't. Uh, and, um, you know, unless, unless you talk about an idea. But I can't think of anything that is expressed in tangible form uh, which uh, uh, would not be included in that definition. Yes? So, what if you're like a botanist? Yes. Is is an organism that you created or spiced together, is that a composition of matter? Yeah, I mean, could you say this? Like, Lays, I believe, has, uh, the Frito-Lay company has copyrighted their potato. Ab absolutely positively, okay? Um, there are plant patents, okay? And um, as long as you have, as a botanist, um, created something new, even if it's based upon a prior species, um, it doesn't matter whether it's a plant or a mouse trap or a piece of code. These four requirements cover everything. And so, yes, uh, I'm certain that Lay's owns the patent to their, their potato. Um, I wish they would figure out a way to make a potato chip that they didn't end up like in crumbs at the bottom of the bag. You know, half the bag is full of potato chips and the rest is just full of, like, crumbs. That's what happens to me all the time. I just remember, like, some farmers, possibly in Russia, but I might get that country wrong, accidentally stumbled upon the same potato strand <laughs> and Lays is now suing them for infringement. Well, that, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it, although, when you think of the infinite possibilities uh, and variations in nature, I find it difficult, at least intuitively, to believe that someone could, st could stumble upon the same mutation in nature. But hey, you know, we have twins and quadruplets and sextuplets, so I suppose it happens. But you know, it's um, uh, notably rare, is what I would say. Anyhow, so. I can't think of anything expressed in tangible form that's not included in this definition. And, and uh, this is the, as I said, the broadest definition of, um, of uh, what constitutes something that uh, qualifies for intellectual pro uh, property protection in the world. So as far as the first requirement is concerned, if it exists materially, it probably satisfies requirement number one, so all you have is three requirements left to satisfy. So the next requirement you have to satisfy is the novelty requirement, which perhaps goes to your plant uh, 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 question. Obviously, one of the things that Lay's, Frito-Lay would do is they would, in suing for infringement, they would allege, or to, if, if, the, if the other potato has been patented, uh, in their application to cancel the patent on that, on that particular species, they would, they would argue that it's not novel, okay? That it's, that it's not new. In order for an invention to be patentable, it must be new as defined by patent law. And this novelty requirement states that an invention cannot be patented if public disclosure of the invention has been made, okay? Now that's different than your question, if it already exists in the public domain or if somebody has already invented it, obviously it's not novel. If you happen to come up with the same mousetrap that somebody else came up with um, and you present it to the patent office, the examiner is going to take a look at the prior art, whether it's a potato or a mousetrap, and they're going to find that somebody else has already invented the exact same thing. And whether by accident or design, your uh, proposed invention, your proposed patent is not novel. It doesn't, re it doesn't satisfy the second requirement. Yes? How does it work in the pharmaceutical industry where you have like brand name and generic drugs? Well, usually what happens is with a generic drug, okay, so you have two, two different types of intellectual property protection there. What, what are the two types? Well, one, you'd have a patent, right? But you also have a trademark. So you can't, 
you know, call it um, by its trade name, okay? But as soon as the patent expires, um, you can produce the same drug as long as you don't call it uh, what the original manufacturer did. And you know, you get a lot of this stuff in South America, which have slight, slightly different patent systems than we, than we have here. Their, their uh, requirements are slightly different. Um, and because those countries are often more interested in promoting um, uh, commerce in their countries, they'll kind of look the other way when it comes to the production of so-called generic drugs. Oftentimes, the generic drugs are not uh, identical chemically uh, to their counterparts, okay? So um, the efficacy is often different, you know, so there are all kinds of dangers associated with um, generic or um, counterfeit drugs. Um, Viagra is a perfect example. I mean, Viagra uh, uh, is sold by, I don't know the name of the company offhand, but here in the United States. But you can buy all kinds of cheap variations of Viagra that are manufactured in Argentina um, in violation most likely of the patent on Viagra. But because countries oftentimes look the other way, um, China is a perfect example uh, uh, where they're uh, oftentimes um, pirating technology. Um, the, 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 they get away with it. But they, but are they violating? Are they infringing? The, the answer is, um, if it's uh, identical and it's within the period before the, the patent has lapsed, they probably are uh, in violation of it. But you're pointing up actually one very large scale practical problem in intellectual property law because there are uh, countries uh, like China and like in South America um, which um, uh, produce uh, counterfeit uh, materials uh, that are in many ways identical to the original uh, in violation of, of intellectual property laws. They, f they f flaunt the intellectual property laws. But before I become too critical of China or South America, I should let you know that Massachusetts practically invented stealing uh, other people's patented technology. If, if you Look at Lowell and New Bedford and many of the Brockton, many of the mill cities around in Massachusetts. Those factories and those fortunes were all made on um, stolen patented technology. Massachusetts, the Massachusetts General Court used to pay a, a reward for uh, people to go to England and steal technology on such advanced things as uh, looms and weaving machines, which is what our economy was based on. So South America, you could say South America and China are just doing the same things uh, we were doing back in the uh, 18th century here. So, um, you know, it's, it's a problem. You had a question, I'm sorry. Maybe not anymore. Um, the, the second half of the novelty um, issue, did, did you have a question? I thought, oh, sorry. Um, the second part of the novelty requirement, which is more important uh, probably for you folks, assuming you've thought of something new, is the public disclosure issue. Public disclosure is a, is a big problem uh, for many inventors, uh, especially when they're trying to fit into the matrix of international uh, intellectual property protection. Uh, so the term prior art, which we've talked about, includes different types of activities, okay? So we've talked about prior art in terms of going on the USPTO website and looking up prior mousetraps to see if your mousetrap puts any daylight in between the prior uh, mousetraps that have been patented by the USPTO. And, and that's what we refer to as prior art. But another form of prior art is disclosures in printed publications. Remember we talked about patent paper pairs. So when you uh, sit down and write an article about your invention, um, that's considered prior art. And uh, that's the same as creating the, it, it, that's an expression of the invention in tangible form, okay? And um, 
that can cause some problems for inventors that I'll, that I'll get into. Sales or commercial use. If you have your mousetrap and you start selling it, uh, or you sell it to a big mousetrap company before you patent it, that's considered uh, prior art, a disclosure, okay? Um, and of course, publish or issued patents. Significantly, disclosures that are made in confidence to third parties will not constitute prior art. So we can talk about your inventions in this class, okay? But if you go to a bar, and after a few drinks, uh, trying to impress somebody on how intelligent you are, you tell them about your idea, that's probably a disclosure, okay? Again, we, we, we talked about how the courts uh, fill in the, the matrix of intellectual property law. What constitutes a disclosure is actually a pretty complicated question, and the courts have many, many, many decisions that are based upon uh, which define what a disclosure is. Um, the statute... Uh, which explains when a public disclosure has been made. Again, this is a, a part of Title 35 of the United States Code. is a pretty complicated thing. Um, but the most important sort of general rule is that an invention will not normally be patentable if, one, the invention was known to the public before it was, quote, invented by the individual seeking patent protection, so a fancy potato, uh, or a mousetrap that maybe you had taken out to a trade show of other mousetrap manufacturers and shown before it became, before you filed a patent application. Uh, secondly, the invention was described in a publication more than one year prior to the filing date. So if you write a paper, uh, we talked about patent paper pairs, if you write a paper uh, and let 12 months go by before you file your patent application, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, have that patent application granted because the disclosure of your invention was made publicly more than a year before your application. Uh, the invention was used publicly, or offered for sale, or demonstrated to the public. Um, this one-year um, disclosure thing is kind of, is kind of special to, to U.S. patent law. It's, it's a grace period, okay? Um, it's called a grace period, um, but in my mind, um, uh, nowadays the world has shrunk, and not everybody follows the same rules. There are, there are countries that follow uh, the um, same approach to novelty that we do here in this country and grant you a one-year grace period. So if you publish your paper on day one, so long as you file your provisional patent application before a year is out, you'll still be able to get that patent. Unless, of course, you happen to be in Europe. In which case, if there's any disclosure prior to the filing of your application, you don't get your uh, patent. Because they're considered absolute novelty jurisdictions. And so with the world shrinking, if you want to market your invention in China or in Europe, and that's more and more likely these days. Uh, patents used to just be a regional thing, but where, where the market is now international, you need to be more cautious about this novelty requirement. And my advice to um, anybody that comes into my office is to file the provisional patent application before you make any disclosure whatsoever. Um, just, uh, just uh, uh, some traps to avoid. Um, simply explaining your invention to friends or coworkers without any obligation of confidentiality uh, may start this clock. So like I said, if you're at a bar and you run into a stranger and you start shooting your mouth off, you could end up losing any right to your invention if you don't file a provisional uh, within one year in a uh, jurisdiction like the United States or lose it all together in an absolute uh, a novelty jurisdiction. And although the United States grants the one-year grace period, other countries don't, and therefore it's always preferable. In fact, I think I need to change that word to it's absolutely essential. If you come into my office and you say, Steve, what should I do? Should I file my provisional uh, or should I publish this paper? My advice to you is always going to be 
file the provisional before you publish your paper. That way you can be sure no matter what jurisdiction you're in, you're still going to be able to satisfy the second uh, requirement of all uh, patented, in, patented inventions, which is novelty. Um, so this is just a little discussion about absolute novelty versus relative novelty. Um, countries that follow the absolute novelty uh, standard uh, uh, um, are like China, Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom, Italy, Spain. So if you want to market something in Europe uh, or in China, uh, you better make sure that no one knows about any disclosures prior to your provisional patent application because you're going to be denied. Um, however, if you're only looking to market in North America and parts of South America, you have that one year grace period. Um, so uh, be mindful of the difference between absolute novelty and relative novelty. Um, in either case, if you file your application after one year or in a, in a relative uh, novelty jurisdiction or one second after you have uh, published it uh, in an absolute novelty jurisdiction, your rights are lost. It's, it's in the public domain and it's, it's free. So, a uh, quick question for the class. Uh, if inventor A publicly discloses or sells the invention prior to the filing of a patent application, is it protectable in the United States? Yes, sir. <laughs> Touche. Depends on what? Right. Exactly. And how about an absolute novelty country? No, absolutely not. Yes, ma'am. In the one-year grace period, could somebody else say, oh, this person's been selling that, or this person's going to be wrong. I'm interested in it, and I want to file a patent application. Great question. And the answer is, uh, it doesn't apply to other people. So if you, as the inventor, have made a public disclosure, OK? Now, it may apply to you if the examiner says, oh, this was already out uh, and is part of the public domain. So it depends on how long it's been out there. So if, if you as an inventor come up with a wonderful mousetrap, but one year and one day prior to that, somebody had published an article describing exactly what you had uh, proposed, then you'd probably be, be out of luck. The patent examiner would look at the prior art, which not only uh, includes prior patents, but all peer review, you know, scientific articles describing the invention, and they'd say, oh, here it is 366 days ago. I'm sorry, I have to, you know, use that rejection stamp. Novelty is not satisfied, okay? But it's a great question. All right, so generally speaking, if an inventor publicly discloses or sells the invention prior to the filing of a patent application, that disclosure or sale will render any patent that may ultimately issue as being invalid for lack of novelty. By the way, you'll be shocked at how many uh, patent cancellation actions are based upon this. Um, maybe the uh, inventor didn't do a very uh, careful search, or maybe the patent examiner didn't do a careful search, but someone who wants to commercially exploit uh, your device and wants to cancel your patent so they can practice it may have information of, of interest to the patent office. And uh, you may find out about it for the first time if you haven't done a thorough uh, prior search uh, that um, your invention is based upon something that's been in the public domain. Yes, sir? Generates most of those cancellation requests. Is it other people filing patents or internally from the PTO? Oh, it's almost always by other people seeking to practice the patent. And it's usually, well, you've heard of patent trolls, right? I mean, well, this university is partially, the endowment of this university is partially built upon patent trolls. That is, people whose sole job is to uh, uh, sue other people for practicing a patent which they believe they own. Um, and that gets into the competition of claims. You know, is, is, there, is their claim broad enough to include another uh, another device, but 
yeah, it usually comes from someone else looking to somehow commercially exploit the technology that you are seeking to have exclusive control over. Yes, sir. It, it, it very well could. Um, it depends on how much, uh, again, it's, there's no it, when you say an idea, you mean an idea that's expressed in tangible form, okay? So if you've written it in a paper, you've described, if, if your thesis is about the best mousetrap, a titanium mousetrap or something like that, okay, uh, that counts as a disclosure. Whether it's you know, whether you're commercially exploiting it or whether, you know, uh, offering it for sale or you're just bragging to your friends. You know, it's kind of like the same as telling somebody at a bar. Any disclosure, any disclosure can constitute um, uh, a uh, waiver of that novelty requirement. It could start, in this country, it starts the clock ticking, okay? Um, so you got to be careful about that. You got to be, and that's why so many patents are accompanied, or so many papers are accompanied by patents nowadays, um, going back to the, uh, the study from Sloan School. Um, so my advice, when in doubt, file a provisional patent application. Simple as that. All right, so that's the two down, two to go, the usefulness requirement. So patent law uh, specifies that the subject matter must be useful. What does useful mean? Uh, in this context, it refers to the condition that the subject matter has a useful purpose. In, in my layman's language, it's got to do something. It can't just sit there, uh, although in a way that's a design patent. But uh, in terms of the utility patents that we're really talking about here, it's got to do something. It can't just sit there and look good, okay, unless it's a design patent. So a device which will not operate or perform the, uh, uh, the purpose for which it is um, uh, intended will not f satisfy the third requirement. Um, now this goes back to your biotechnology question. This is really important. And this was the whole uh, basis for the, the CRISPR decision and the fight between the Broad Institute and uh, Stanford. Um, what happens is, again, the most complicated, expensive litigation in the history of patent technology all comes down to one of these four little, four little requirements. In that case, the usefulness requirement was attacked by the Broad, who said uh, that um, Stanford's technology didn't satisfy this. Um, and that's because it did not operate to perform the intended purpose. Now, how do we know what the intended purpose of an invention is? You look at the application and you look at the claims. The claims will tell you what the intended purpose is, to catch mice, okay? Um, and if it doesn't perform that function, um, uh, or if the function that um, you're attempting to um, patent has not been proven as technologically feasible by you, then you're probably not satisfying the usefulness requirement. And there's been a lot of debate about whether, going back to the, yes, sir. Well, I just wanted to ask where, uh, like, music and art and all those types of things. How, how I'm sorry? Uh, music and art, how do those, music those and fall? Like, I remember way back when the Napster was getting attacked by, like, Metallica and some of the other bands to sell off their music. Um, well, so there's some sort of protection there, but I guess where, where does, how does that work? Well, that's copyright law, of course, right? Um, because it has to do with um, a artistic composition. Um, or music, okay, like Happy Birthday, all right? And, you know, Metallica is no different than, you know, the, the sisters from Missouri who, you know, claim to have come up with Happy Birthday. Um, and so what happens in that particular case, um, just running through your example, Metallica uh, composes an original piece of music, something that's novel, something that is new, something that's original. And what they do it, as soon as they finish um, writing the score on a computer or a piece of paper, uh, they own the copyright to it. But being careful artists and having very good lawyers, they also take their composition and they register it with the copyright office. Okay? And then they are then presumed to be 
the originators of the art. And that's a good thing to have when you're in court because the presumption is in your favor. But if you don't register it, it doesn't mean you don't own it. It just means that um, it's harder to prove that you're the originator of the work. And then if somebody comes along and infringes, uh, Metallica comes to a guy like me, and they say, here's our composition, here's what they're selling, and either the lyrics are the same or the composition is the same, um, we think that they're infringing on our work. And now people in my business have uh, very interesting, effective tools uh, in order to prove that. There are computer software programs that compare compositions and lyrics, and in fact can compare entire uh, manuscripts and books to see whether or not uh, there is stealing going on. Um, you know, you can't take a Metallica song and change one note and expect to get your own copyright on it. If it is substantially the same, then you're probably infringing. Now, how much changing there has to be depends, you know. Um, again, you have to have sufficient daylight between your, um, uh, the prior art and your composition in order to qualify for protection. And when it comes to things like um, uh, musical compositions or computer software, you really have to put some distance between the, the, the two, especially for forms of artistic expression like music. Um, you know, that, that industry, um, you know, a whole song can be, th you know, the important part of a whole song can be three notes. And if you just use those three notes, you can still be infringing, even though the rest of the composition uh, if they happen to be particularly catchy and define the work, you know, um, you can be infringing by just, by just a, a small amount. So Metallica hires a good lawyer and the good lawyer hopefully has a good software program and the software program either proves or doesn't prove that uh, the composition is substantially similar and if it's substantially similar you're infringed and you're infringing and you can't, you can't use it. Um, did I see a question in the back? No? All right. So uh, back to the, um, uh, the, the usefulness requirement in genetic technologies. Um, uh, here's a quote from the Council on Bioethics on this subject. Since the development of large-scale DNA sequencing techniques over the past 10 years, more DNA sequencing sequences have become available without a concomitant understanding of their function. As a result, many patent applications have been filed on genes or parts of genes without the demonstration of credible utility. It's not useful, uh, and it has to have been demonstrated. This is where the Broad was able to prove that, the, that Stanford's uh, patent on the gene editing technology was invalid because Stanford was unable to prove that their, their claims had credible utility. They had not demonstrated this gene editing technique in higher life forms like human beings. It was great for um, uh, multicellular uh, creatures, uh, but it had only theoretical application in animals. And so, um, uh, of course, Stanford argued that you know, there's no novelty here. This is, uh, this is just a common sense application of what we've already patented. Uh, but um, their own scientists, when they trumpeted their invention, actually went on TV and talked about what their, their invention could and could not do. And they actually gave interviews to major science publications where they said, well, no, we haven't been able to prove this technique uh, effective uh, in human beings, and so guess what they, the broad used uh, as proof in court that, the, that Stanford had not proven the credible utility of their invention. It was the statements of their own scientists, their own, in fact, the president of, uh, of um, the group that uh, uh, had patented the technology out at, St at Stanford. So um, I have a sign in my office. It says, no fish ever got caught what kept its mouth shut. And that not only applies to criminal defendants, but it applies to people uh, in the intellectual property world. Um, 
if you file a patent application, you know, my advice is to not go on TV and tell people what it doesn't do. Because somebody's going to come along and figure out what it doesn't do, and then they're going to own the technology. So if it doesn't do something, if you suspect it doesn't have credible utility, don't tell anybody. <laughs> All right? You may ultimately lose anyhow, but don't make it so easy. And in fact, what tipped the case in the Broad's favor was the testimony uh, of their own people uh, to uh, science magazines. No credible utility. They weren't able to demonstrate the usefulness requirement. Um, this is more on basically the, the, the same thing. Um, if it's unattainable and unproven, um, it, it's not patented, okay? And if the patent office, by mistake, early, in the early days of biotechnology, the patent office was granting these broad, broad, broad patents. When I say broad patents, they were granting patents on inventions with very broad claims because the technology was new and the expertise simply didn't exist in the patent uh, office. And what they were finding is that they were, they, were, they were basically granting what we call kitchen sink patents, where everything, everything conceivable was being claimed by the inventor. And slowly but surely, they've had, they've had to whittle these cases down, just like the Broad had to, in, had to whittle down the people at Stanford in many, many areas in gene, uh, especially uh, gene editing and gene patents, we've had to go back and redo the work of the Patent and Trademark Office uh, by showing that they never should have uh, granted these patents because the claims were far too broad. And nowadays, though, examiners are very picky about uh, credible utility. So it, it, the Wild West is over at the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, if you go in there now, you can expect to be uh, held to a very, very high standard. And you have to show that everything in your claim has credible utility. Otherwise, it will be considered speculative and not patentable. Again, this is just you know, the third requirement of usefulness. So the last requirement, non-obviousness. Okay? Statutory, novelty, okay? usefulness. And the last requirement, non-obviousness. What does non-obviousness mean? Just means uh, it, it, it's, it can't be the same as something prior. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, I've always talked about the daylight that you have to put between yourself and prior art. So if you, of course, uh, come in with a, uh, a mouse trap, which is exactly like something that has been patented before, What's going to happen? You're going to get that big rejection from the Patent and Trademark Office. That's pretty obvious. But if your mousetrap is a combination of two or three or four prior patents all rolled into one, what is the Patent Office going to do? They're going to reject you because your invention is obvious. It's based upon prior art. And if, it's, and if it's based upon prior art and designed to do exactly the same thing, it's considered to have failed the obviousness uh, test, the non-obviousness test. Now, if you take three or four or more prior patents, put them together to do something new, then you meet the uh, non-obviousness requirement. Then you, have some, you actually have something that's, that's patentable. Uh, yes? Is the standard here like, less stringent if you, like, just on the basic, like, for, in terms of, like, infringement? Like, if you put, put three or four mousetraps together and it, like, maybe isn't obvious, but you're not, like, like, maybe you own two of those patents but not, like, the third, like, mm -hmm. could you get sued for infringing on absolutely you can get sued you know that's the thing about the world um, you know it's the funny thing that's something all clients come to me and they say well you know I, I just want to make sure we don't get sued there's no way you can get you, you can avoid suit people sue for the craziest craziest things is it likely that someone will prevail in a case like that not probably not okay 
again, simple metric, is there daylight? Even if my stuff is based upon prior art, have I combined it in such a way to do something new and useful? You know, that's statutory, that's novel, that's useful, and non-obvious, okay? Um, the basic obvious, obviousness inquiry was uh, set forth in this famous case of Graham versus uh, John Deere. Um, and uh, basically the answer is it's really complicated, okay? And it's really something that depends on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you're advocating in favor of the technology, what you need to be able to show in court is that there are differences between what you have invented and the prior art. And if you're challenging a patent, your job is to show how this does not satisfy the non-obviousness test. It's just something that someone of common skill and experience which would be obvious to almost the, you know, anybody. Okay? It doesn't take any specialized skill. But John Deere, um, not all that helpful because it basically says this is, this is real, uh, real complicated stuff. Um, this KSR uh, Teflix case, it's another uh, 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 very unhelpful case to people like me. The Supreme Court delved into the non-obviousness requirement and they said it's a matter of common sense, which is about as useful as I don't know what. Um, what does common sense mean? The Supreme Court has never defined what common sense is. But it gives you an idea that, of, of how complicated and subjective this analysis is, but it's something you need to be conscious of when you're filing a patent application and having that dialogue with the patent examiner. Um, so I wanted to... Uh, you can go online and look at the non-obviousness requirement and uh, the six obviousness factors. Um, is it combining prior art? Is it, a, is, it a, is it a substitution of one known element for another? A known technique to improve a similar device in the same way that doesn't do anything new? Is it applying a known improvement technique in a way that would yield predictable results? rather than unpredictable novel results? Uh, is it choosing a finite number of identifiable, predictable solutions that have a, a reasonable expectation to succeed? If, uh, if so, um, it might be obvious. Okay? Let, let's use an example. Uh, what if I patented um, a um, mousetrap um, that was um, uh, three feet, uh, three feet, that's some, that's some mouse three inches by two inches. Uh, and somebody came along and, and, and tried to patent a device that was four inches by six inches. Is it patentable? Somebody's shaking their head, no, of course not. Why? Obvious, exactly. What if it was painted a different color? Intuitively, you'd be correct, but Here's where I get to, I get to have fun uh, and say that it's still a very subjective thing. Here's a question I would get wrong every time on the, the patent exam, okay? Um, or here's some things that are, you know, some changes to products that would not normally be patentable, okay? Substitution of one material for another, changes in size, changes in color, okay? Kind of gone over that. So. Here's the question I, I would get wrong even today on the patent exam, if there was such a thing. Here's the claim. A blade for a ceiling fan, said blade incorporating or constructed of phosphorescent materials, said ceiling fan being arranged for attachment to a ceiling. That's the actual claim that was made on the patent application. So the question is, is, is this device patentable? Seems like? It seems like it shouldn't be. <laughs> I say no. You, <laughs> well, that's only because you know I'm always wrong with this question. Um, um, tell me why you would say yes. Because this could be used as a nightlight situation for a child providing light and getting 
Well, uh, you know, the first time I raised my hand in a, in a law school class, um, I, I answered a question some, something like this, and the professor said to me something that I've never forgotten to this day, which was, Mr. Lyons, you couldn't possibly be more wrong. So let me paraphrase my, my, my professor. You could not possibly be more right. Congratulations, you're exactly right, okay? I hope that makes you feel as good as, it, as he made me feel bad uh, in, my, in, in law school. But you're absolutely right. And this is why I probably would get it wrong. Um, but you're right. There's a usefulness thing you could argue. Remember we talked about the Coca-Cola patented sweetener for Coca-Cola. And they added the antioxidant quality to it. The, the darn stuff is made of wood cellulose, just like everything else is. But they added this antioxidant quality to it, which made it patentable. Well, uh, there's the patent, U.S. patent number 8622700. There's the description, and there's the actual schematic from the patent application. So a ceiling fan is in the public domain. Ain't nobody, like, you know, improving much on that, really. Um, it's like a wheel. Uh, but this particular ceiling fan, because of what it's made of, because, it's, because of how it's painted, was deemed to be um, patentable because it satisfied the four requirements. And what are they? Statutory, usefulness, novelty, non-obviousness. Thank you very much. On Friday, I'm going to bring in some prototypes for you. And we're actually going to see how you write a patent application. We're going to talk about making claims and how to file it, and so forth. So uh, Friday, you'll be able to walk out and protect your intellectual property. Thank you very much.